Hi, this is Megan Bell, and I'm here for Magic Image Hollywood Magazine, and we are interviewing famous actor Ken Davidian. That's me. That's I don't him. know about famous. <laughs> yes, you are. Could you please just tell us a little bit more about your background? I know we hear a lot about the Borat and um, your time with that show and everything, but I would really love to learn a little bit more about where you're from and uh, a little whatever you want to tell us about your life. Okay. Early years. Uh, early years. Early years. Uh, I was born in East Los Angeles. Okay. I lived there till I was about uh, 29, 27. I got married and I lived in uh, my grandmother's house in East LA. I went to Griffith Junior High School, Garfield High School, East LA College, and Cal State Long Beach. And all through it, I was a theater arts major. That's all I wanted to do. I would go to classes and get excused so I could go to the theater. And they would excuse me because I was the one doing the, the plays, I was doing the, the assemblies, I was like a football player, but in the theater. So I loved it. I loved the attention. I loved that I didn't have to do any work. Uh, now it's bad because I can't spell very well. But <laughs> it was great and it was my mechanism because I was a short and fat guy. So I, I made everybody laugh. I, I, I had a good time. My grandmother was an actress in the Armenian community. And okay. my family was in waste removal, which is picking up garbage. Right. So when I saw my grandmother on stage reading a play, they were rehearsing, and I thought she didn't even write it. All she's doing is saying it. That looks a lot easier than picking up garbage. And so I said, that's what I want to do. And it only took 50 years. And so was she your inspiration then, you would say, to get into acting? Yes. She, she and then while I was in this, I was 13 years old. I remember uh, reading a TV Guide article okay. that said Michael Landon, one of the stars of Bonanza, makes $25,000 a week. And this is in the 60s. And I thought, yeah, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. But yes. it, it wasn't easy. I, I majored in uh, college. After college, right, like weeks before graduation, I got a uh, part in a movie called Real Life. And they told me, because I had agent, I was trying and doing it then. Doing. They told me that this guy, he's a new young director, and if he likes you, you're going to go with him. It's, 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 it, so I, I, I don't know. I never heard his name before. So I went to do the part. It was Albert Brooks. And Albert Brooks has become a great director and he, five years ago uh, he won uh, Best Supporting Actor for a movie that was produced by a friend of mine, uh, uh, Gary Walters. So Funny I'm here, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but that was the defining moment because when I went to the premiere to see the movie, and I had a few friends with me, and I kept saying, okay, okay, I'm right, right here. No, no, wait, wait, it's coming, it's cut. it's right. Okay, I, I don't know. I don't know, I, I got paid for it. I, 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 you and they thinking. cut, cut me out know. of the movie completely. Oh. Completely. <laughs> I got my SAG oh. card 10 years later because oh. of that movie because I had already gotten it, but I didn't know that. I didn't know the rules, I didn't know the regulations, so I just thought, the heck with this, and I was going out with somebody. I wanted to get married, but I didn't want to disturb the career, but I got married, I got on a waste removal truck, and I started picking up garbage. But everything was toward that. I never changed what I wanted to do. I'll give you an example. 
I took $2,700 worth of customers that my father gave me and I made that into $150,000 worth of customers monthly. So I went from 27, it took about three, four years. Mm -hmm. I went to $150,000 a month. I had six trucks. I was doing very well. What was your motivation through that? My motivation was I was spending so much time in my youth not doing all the things that everybody else did. My friends would go out and party after the uh, uh, performances yeah. and I would get on a truck and go to work. My friends smoked weed. I didn't smoke weed until I was 30 years old. They used to go and party and I didn't do all that because I was focusing on a career. And then when I wasn't in the movie, I think I was just, I, I was heartbroken. Now I know, now I understand. But then I had a child uh, and that was fabulous. But I always did bit parts. I always did this, I always did that. Then a friend of mine came to me and said, this country of Mexico wants a waste removal company to go to DF and to pick up trash in an industrial city called Naucalpan. Hmm. Now, and I was doing really, really well. But my friend and partner was a cinema major from USC. <laughs> really? So I bid on the city of Malibu to pick up the trash. Yes. But it was only because I wanted to meet movie stars. And <laughs> you had a plan the yes, whole time. Yes, I had a plan. <laughs> and I became very good friends at the time with Martin Sheen. That's okay. another story. <laughs> uh, so we, we contracted the city of Malibu so we can show the Mexican government that we could pick up the hills and, and all of the, this stuff. Okay. And I brought the uh, mayor of Naucalpan and federal officials to Los Angeles, they saw how we ran our business and they allowed us to make a proposal. So it was BFI, Waste Management, uh, and us. Okay. And those two were conglomerates. Yes, those are large. But we had the personal touch. When the, uh, it was Mayor uh, Don Luis de Chavez, he was the mayor of Nalcalpan, and he said, I want you to paint the trucks the Mexican colors and the other we're having a corporate meeting mm -hmm. so they're trying to decide who to pick and I said the waste management guy says our corporate colors are green right so we have to call Chicago to see if we can change the green okay I can't make that decision and then the guy from uh, uh, Browning Ferris says hey our colors are blue well I, I can't change corporate colors and then he looked at me and my partner and I says, I'll put the Mexican Eagle on the truck. <laughs> Nobody tells me what to do. It's my company. There you go. And that's what they wanted. They wanted somebody that they can work with. So we got the contract. Did you actually move down to Mexico? Three all? years I lived in Mexico. Oh, okay. And when we had a problem, we were supposed to go to... Uh, uh, Clinton or uh, Salinas. Well, because this was a NAFTA thing. Oh, okay. This yeah. was NAFTA. This was American waste removal company yes. going to Mexico. We had started already putting gas extraction in landfills mm. and uh, buying our trucks from Canada. That was the three things. Okay. And we're talking about, we're going to need hundreds Right. of trucks. We're gonna, this is going to be a big deal. Big operation. So yeah. we got in partnership with uh, a landfill company and then the problems arose where we had a problem. They wanted us, the, the people that we were working us wanted us to buy trucks from Mercedes. Well, we couldn't do that. We had to buy trucks from Canada. When we went to talk to the higher ups, uh, Salinas was busy because of a, a scandal he had. 
and Clinton was busy because of a scandal he had, and we filed arbitration under NAFTA, and I lost everything. The contract and... Everything. 4,000 square foot house in Walnut. Mm. Walnut Diamond Bar. Mm -hmm. My six truck operation, I filed bankruptcy for $5 million. I had a nine unit apartment building. I had, but we always drove new cars. I, the brunt of everything was on me. I had to file bankruptcy and I got a letter from the arbitrators that said, we know that you didn't speak Spanish and we don't know what happened, but we're not going to blame it on you. It was uncontrollable circumstances. Sorry. And that was the, and we, we were at a, a week, we had a meeting, uh, uh, a hearing in Washington, D.C. So it was, again, destroyed me completely. And when I came back, I said, okay, I went to school to be an actor, and that's what I'm going to do. And for the first year, oh, my wife is going to kill me when I say this. For the first year, two years, we were on welfare. We were on actually on welfare. And little by little by little by little, I made everything I could do until God said, hey, go do Borat. And I had done 120 different television and movie appearances. So how did that work out with you getting that call? Was it, you know, your agent saying, come in, I want you to, I mean, no. tell us about no. that. No, it's again, and this is the only advice that anybody can give you that, that I give everybody. Persistence and preparation. Because people are not prepared. They come here thinking, hey, I did a play in high school and they said I was good. Right. And that is not enough no. to get you in front of a camera like this. You have to have that kind of training. If you couldn't pronounce my name four or five times, if you couldn't pronounce what we were doing, just, just 15 minutes of that, then I would have said, hey, listen, guys, why don't we do this some other time? Okay? Right. I, 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 yeah. Josh, I love you. Uh, Solicito, I love you. But I, 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 we'll out. do it another time. Yes. I understand. You're on, you're on it. It's got to happen. And that's what you got to know. And if you're not prepared, then that's the hard part. But if you are, this job is not a job. It's a pleasure to be able to give people uh, a laugh, to be able to have them forget about the crap that's going on in their lives. One of the things I didn't tell you is my second son, uh, from zero birth to eight years old, had 39 surgeries. Oh. This was a, 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 I mean, it killed the whole family but and and it was during the time where we had money and then even during the time we didn't have money mm -hmm. but we all stuck together and we and he's a writer now so uh everything you just have to try and you have to work and you have to keep focused but it all worked after that one movie that everybody thinks oh you overnight success so, right, that's it, a it big misconception yes. in general in Hollywood. Someone comes out here, they do a movie, they're it, that's it. Yeah, you know, they they just made it right then. But yeah, but that's not the truth. The yeah. truth is, I, I didn't make it till I was in my fifties. You, it's just not, it's not that simple. I don't care how good you are, how how lucky you are. It's all a matter of all of it. It's not just one thing, but. If you don't know what you're doing after you've set up everything, you come to LA, you meet the right people, you get the agent, you get SAG, they give you a job that people would die for and 
Then you're going, uh, uh, uh. And I know they fire you because I got fired. I got fired from my first guest appearance and it was on, uh, uh, and both of these people are friends of mine now, the, <laughs> Do Doogie Howser yes. and, uh, and the guy that played Monk. They had a TV <laughs> show called Stark Raving Mad and my son worked at Starbucks uh, on Ventura Boulevard and the whole family knew I got this part. And it was good. It was a great part. I went, I, I swear it's a true story. I went to the table read and I was overwhelmed. Wow, look at the guys I'm, Monk hadn't started yet, but I knew who he was and I knew Doogie Howser and I'm at CBS Radford and there's this big uh, uh, table uh, and everybody's reading their parts. It was a table read. And now my agents know I don't go to table reads. I've only been to one other table read, and I'll tell you about that too. I, I don't know. I just was looking and looking, and then it was my thing, and I went, uh, uh, and I turned the page, and I found it, and I read it, and it happened again. It happened the next time I was supposed to read something. I was not reading along with them. I was not focusing. I was just so turned on again true story. When I got my dressing room, it wasn't a trailer. It was an office in a, in a building for dressing room at CBS Radford. Yes. And I, honest to God, I got in front of the mirror and I did a little dance. I was so turned on. Then after that, we went downstairs and we started rehearsing. We rehearsed about seven o'clock I got in the car, I'm driving, and at that time it was pagers. Yes. And I got a page from my agent. Yeah. <laughs> I got a page from my agent, and he lives on Cahuenga on the other side of Riverside, just a block away. And I got, uh, I stopped at a gas 70, I think it was a, mo it's a mobile station on Cahuenga. So you that's how, this, yeah. That's how vivid this And is. I used this phone and I called him and he said that, look, I don't know how to tell you, but they don't want you to come back. And my family knew about it before me oh. because that's why I said my son worked at Starbucks. Mm -hmm. There was a fat guy that worked at Starbucks and he said, I got to get off. I got to get off. They called me for emergency audition. And my son knew the name of the show I was on. And my son realized I was the fat guy. And they said, we fired a fat guy and we're looking for a replacement. And he called his mother and said, have you heard from dad? I think, I think he got fired. And they knew about it before I did. And again, dust yourself off, pick yourself up. This is the ultimate of rejection. But you keep going. You keep going because so you, you believe in yourself and you just got to keep going. And that's just one story. So you said you don't do table reads anymore. Yeah. Is the, tell me a little bit. Of I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm table gun shy read. So, <laughs> uh, but after Borat, uh, I got a call from uh, Warner Brothers. They wanted me to play the uh, burly guy. That's what it had in the script. Burly guy. The burly guy in the bathroom in the Get Smart movie with Steve Carell. And they wanted uh, me to speak another language. And I speak Armenian. So, and I said, no, I don't want the part. I, I, I want to meet the director. I don't, I, I don't want the part. I don't want to be, I don't want to go from Borat to Burly Man. Mm -hmm. So uh, I met with the director and the director said, I knew you speak English, but I didn't know you speak English. And I said, oh, okay. He says, we thought you were going to be like a, a, you know, an old man that we'd have to take care of on location and, and stuff. I said, no, I'm, a, I'm an actor and uh, I want the part of Stalker because when the show was on television, 
I was a kid and I would watch the show and Stocker was the only short fat guy. Then I would say, oh, I want to play him. I want to play him. And here I am right there and they want me to play something else. So he said, you know what? Come to the table read. And that's the only other table read I went to. And oh. right after that table read, he said, congratulations, you got the part. So, so you left table reads on a high note. Yes, but I still don't like them. <laughs> so Ken, can you tell us a little bit um, about how it was to shoot that naked scene in Borat? Cold. Cold. It was very cold. Uh, they told me, in fact, they have a movie, an entire movie called The Making of Borat, but it hasn't been released yet. And in that movie, they showed clips of me when they asked me, and I said, no, 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 come on, guys, come on, guys. <laughs> yeah. Fat guy in boxers. Funny, funny, that's funny enough. No, 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 Woo. naked. I said, listen, if I get naked, people are going to go like this. And he said, yeah, that's what we want. So and Larry Charles is the director, and... We did the room, the, the, the room at the hotel with a stunt person. And it, that was, it, we did, it took about three hours okay. to get the TV to hit, to, all that stuff. But right after, out of that room, nothing was done twice. It was a one-time shot deal, and it was... I believe four different hotels because you can't run naked in the hotel for very long. No. No, they'll come and they'll find you. They will. So we, I'm telling, oh, how do you know? Well, we got another interview here. How do you know? Oh, no, this is your interview. Okay. So uh, it was, we were in La Jolla on, on the, the fight scene, but when I got out of the room, and we ran into the elevator, you can see if you watch the movie that I'm on one side of the elevator and Sasha's on the other side and the camera guy was on my side. So Sasha grabs my hand and pulls me over to stand next to him because we're not going to do this again. So it, it, and, and it showed that. Uh, and everybody in that elevator had no idea. But then we got to the, uh, uh, that was done. We did that at that hotel. Then we went to another hotel because we wanted a, a, a something that had uh, women and children uh, and, and dresses and, and tuxedos. Okay. And it, we found a broker's convention. The reason we wanted those elements is because we ran naked into a luncheon for engineers in Dallas. And these were engineers, they were, they were listening to a, a guy at the podium and we ran in and the guy at the podium just stood there. And about 60 people, all with notepads and everything, they just stood there, they just went. Nobody said, what are you doing? What's going on? No reaction whatsoever. So my biggest uh, job was to make, follow what he's doing and make sure of what he's going to do next. And that's very hard because he spoke Hebrew. I spoke Armenian. So I'm looking at his eyes and he looks at the audience and he looks at me and he says, the F word, forget it. Okay, and we walked out of there like we were fully dressed, like we were wearing tuxedos. We just walked out like, like Sinatra and Dean Martin. <laughs> we didn't care. And we decided we had to do it where there were women and children. So when we got, we were in rows and Larry Charles says, you see those two black doors? You go through them and you go straight and there's the stage. We had no idea who was inside. We had no idea how many people. Nothing. The only thing I said was, don't run fast. You're skinny and you're younger than I am and you're chasing me. 
So he's trying to run slow. And when the doors opened and I looked at what was there, I was just, oh shit. And I ran a little bit and then I slipped, I fell. <laughs> and he fell on top of me and then we got up, we, we got to the stage and then we got arrested. He got arrested by a policeman that's on our payroll that is a San Diego policeman, but he was off duty working for us. And I got arrested by two de uh, uh, hotel detectives. That's so now they grab me and they take me outside in the lobby and I'm naked. I'm totally, and I'll tell you, not only is it cold, it's nighttime. It's 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night and the shrinkage is true in the cold. <laughs> it goes from this to this. So I'm, I'm standing there with these two detectives and this tall, older gentleman with white hair comes up, shows his badge, San Diego Police Department, I'll take him from here. And I saw the director walk by, so I know he, he knows I'm arrested. I saw Anthony, the cameraman, walk by, so he knows I'm arrested. So now he, we're going down the steps outside. I'm naked still. And he, th this guy says, get into that van and put your head down. And I said, who are you, the Lone Ranger? I said, shut up. And I got in the van, and the guy, his name was Ruben. He was the director of the making of. But he was sitting in a van. So as soon as he got me in there, he told that guy, get out of here. We didn't know where to go. We had a walkie-talkie, because Ruben had a walkie-talkie. We went to the train depot. And we stayed there in the van for 45 minutes until somebody could figure out where we should go so I can get some clothes. Because so we didn't think the whole time. Yeah, we never thought <laughs> to put the clothes here. The clothes were in our rooms upstairs. We never thought, oh, we're going to need our clothes later. Yes. So it might be important. Yeah. You know. And then I have a, I had a hot dog stand on Ventura Boulevard in Beverly Glen, and this kid came up and he looked at me and looked at me, and he said. I saw you naked and I thought oh you saw uh, uh, you know a clip or you saw a screening because it's go it's happening now okay and but it's not open yet we haven't it's not out he says no my father's a broker I was there <laughs> and I was like okay here's your hot dog and he was taking out money I said no 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 go 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 I just wanted to get him out of the hot dog stand so, oh my gosh. but it was a. Did he bring back any friends? No, <laughs> no. I thought he would too. <laughs> I left that, that day. But uh, it was change of life. Change of life. They told me, Larry Charles says it's going to make the movie. It's going to be the funniest scene. Come on. Really? Two naked guys running around. I don't know. But it was. It worked. Thank you, God. And Larry Charles. And um, so do you keep in contact with any of the cast from Borat? No, no. I saw one guy at Habit. Uh, you see them on and off at other places. But this is the one thing I don't like about this business. You go, you're together, whether it's 11 years on Everybody Loves Raymond, or if it's mm -hmm. four months on making a movie, and then it's over and everybody goes to do something else and you only see them, you know, when it's an award season or something. We're not, hello, how are you, uh, okay. on the phone. No, yeah. not like that. So one of your idols growing up was Burt Reynolds, correct? Can you tell us about... Um, I just what? thought he was cool. Yeah? Yeah. I see you had the mustache, so yeah. did yeah. that influence the mustache No, 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 no. The womanizing is what, <laughs> uh, the influence I got from him. Oh, no. Because he's cool. And, and, and he's got a hairy chest. Yes. And, and he's got hairy arms. And your generation is shaved all over, male and female. <laughs> and I'm from the James Bond, uh, Burt Reynolds time where men were men. And they had hair. The Sean Connery type. Yeah. And the, only, the only problem is that it stopped growing on my head. And it's growing 
everywhere else. <laughs> so, but that's, that happens with age, right? Yes, you I know. know. What I are know. you gonna do? You don't know yet. <laughs> So, all right, what else, what so, other questions you got down there? You said the womanizing. I know, like, there's a whole um, kind of, like, playboy type of, of feel that was going on during that time. Do you feel like that influenced you at all? You said the womanizing with Burt Reynolds. Is, do yeah, you that it influenced, influenced me. But you know what influenced me the most is to build up your charisma and your personality because of your lack of being a hottie. I have no abs. I, I have never had a girl go, <gasps> so, you know, mostly it's, <sighs> so you have to, you have to counter that with something. And it's, it's, so I asked somebody and that's exactly what they said. They said, yes, but you're charming. I said, okay, I'll accept that. I don't care. Whatever the, whatever works. Yeah. So but, you admired uh, that, the charm, the charisma. Yeah, I like that and almost, I can't think of any part of this business I don't like. I saw an <laughs> interview that uh, uh, Rosie O'Donnell did in her show years ago and it was uh, Al Pacino and they had to clear the audience. And I've met Al and Al is not a people person if, he does, if you don't know him. And this is very common among these great, great professionals. Really? They're, they're not, you don't see them out. No. I like the PR. I like the, the, the premieres. I like the voiceover uh, 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 when you have to go and you do I like everything about it. I was doing extra work the day before I got Borat. Only because, and I had done a lot of stuff. I was a, a good guest star you were a type known of thing. Actor, yeah, yeah. Of course. But I just think it feels better to be on that side of the gate. You see that red thing right there? That red light. That's when that red light is on. So are you? Yeah, but I'm. I'm. I try to make it all the time. That's your personality. That's you know. I don't want to be. Uh, oh, he's a real good actor, but uh, he's an a-hole. I'm. Who was the favorite, your most favorite person that you've worked with thus far? Can you have, can you name one or two that you just... Jim Carrey. Really? Mm -hmm. okay. Jim Carrey was insane. <laughs> and I learned a lot in a week when I was, uh, we were doing uh, Man on the Moon. And Jim mm -hmm. Carrey came to the table read. I didn't, I was there, but I didn't read. But this was even before I got fired. Oh. He came to the table read in uh, an alter ego of, of the character that he was playing. <laughs> because the character had two characters. The guy okay. that would be at the piano bar singing wild guy, and then he had uh, Latka. So he came as the wild guy in a Cadillac, convertible 1962 Cadillac. I know because I had one. Oh. And he came with two very beautiful, similar looking blondes. <laughs> Thank you. And he was holding a Jack Daniels bottle and he started screaming, this script is stupid. I don't want to do this. This is ridiculous. And he started ripping the pages. And I'm a nobody, nobody. I, I'm not even a nobody. I'm a nobody, nobody. But there's four tables, long tables, mm -hmm. of the most important people you could think of. Danny DeVito was the producer. All of the people that were on Taxi were there. Yes. All of them, all the real people. I was playing an extra on Taxi that was on the TV show all the time. So I had to be there the whole week. Mm -hmm. And Milos Forman, the director, after all of that, we're, doing, we're shooting our scenes and Foreman comes down and he says, I want one of you comedian guys to go and make the audience laugh. So what audience? I'm bringing in audience so it'd be just like doing uh, uh, the show. So now look who's there. Jim Carrey's there. Uh, every taxi, Judd Hirsch, 
uh, uh, Tony Danza, everybody's in, in, just sitting here. And I, nobody, nobody, I said, hey, why don't you get a captain's, a fireman's hat and a hose and go out there and make them laugh? Because that's what Jim Carrey did on a, a TV show he was with the Wayne Brothers. He, he did this crazy uh, fireman <laughs> thing. Yeah. They all, everybody went silent. Carrie looked at me like I killed his mother. Oh. It was, made me from nobody, nobody to nobody, nobody, nobody. And then they told me, don't you understand? He's in character. He could never get out of character and go do that. Don't you this, don't you that. I read about C Carrie. Mm -hmm. I understood what he was doing. And near the end of the week, I was standing at the bleachers. And it was the first time he talked to me. He came up to me and he says, so how's it going? And I said, hey, you still work at Jerry's Deli? And he goes, now you got it. Yeah, I'm there on Mondays because I don't think this taxi show is going to make it. So I want to keep my job. Why don't you come by on a Monday? I'll give you a sandwich. I said, okay. And... That was where I learned how to stay in character, how to, all of these things. But it, it comes with, you know, training. I did uh, a movie that won the Academy Award called The Artist. It was yeah. black and white and silent. Look at me. Yeah. Do I look like I could be silent? No. No. No, I don't think you'd want to be, right? And, and, and when I went to school, they had already <laughs> finished all the classes for the silent TV. <laughs> And silent movies. Right. So it was another experience and you learn. But if if you go, uh, 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 and you don't know where to stand and you don't know where the light is and you haven't learned your lines and you're not prepared, you can get fired. The show does not go on. Oh, it will go on. With you. Without you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what happens. That's, true. That's the reality. Because it's not show, it's show business. And business means a lot of money. Yes. So let's sw switch gears a little bit. Um, I know that in your father's history, he was um, actually captured by Nazis. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That's kind of crazy, right? I mean, well, he was <laughs> a villager. He lived in a village in Armenia, and this was right after uh, uh, World War. This was when World War II too, yeah. was starting, mm -hmm. but it was after the Armenian Genocide. And Armenians were mm -hmm. split all over the world, but the Soviets took care of Armenia, Armenia, and the Turks stopped what they were doing. My father was born in a little village in Armenia. So, Armenia is part of Soviet uh, Russia. It's a satellite, like Romania, like all these countries okay. were. So he was drafted into the Soviet army. Well, what, what was understood is that all of these other people are not Russian. So the Russian leaders would send the other soldiers to the front. Oh, yes. So, yeah. and hey, that's, you know, I don't know. That's what they would do. And these people would get shot, killed, or captured. My father got captured and he was taken to a work camp in uh, uh, Auschwitz. Oh. Yes, but it's one? not the camp, it's not oh. nowhere compared to a uh, Holocaust camp. Okay. This was called a DP camp, where people that were what they called displaced people. So in this particular one, there were 4,600 Armenians, and it was where they would make shoes, where they would fix guns, where they, I mean, it was, you couldn't leave, but you, they, they, you cooked your own food, you fed, you had your family, you lived in the, uh, they gave you an apartment there, and you had to do what you were told. I think one of the mm. weird things was they would bring the uh, gold out of people's mouths, and at the camp they had to melt them down into bars and, and oh all of that gosh. stuff. Yeah, it wasn't, listen, my aunts have stories of the bombs, the bombs, and 
Uh, uh, one of my aunts saw her friend get raped by a, a, a Nazi in the barn. I mean, they were not living well, but when they were, uh, when Germany was, uh, Berlin was liberated, uh, the President of the United States had sent an Armenian guy who owned a restaurant called Omar Khayyam in San Francisco. And he sent this Armenian guy to make sure that there was enough food in Berlin for all of the troops. Mm -hmm. So on his way, he saw an Armenian flag. Okay. And he asked his guys, what is this? What? And they said, we don't know. So they went in and this guy, his name is George Mardikian. And George Mardikian signed and sponsored 4,600 Armenians to come to the United States. Oh. And the largest majority of them came to Montebello in near okay. East LA. And they started two different industries, waste removal okay. and uh, catering trucks, oh, where they would get the catering trucks and they would go to uh, uh, big uh, different Events. factories. Oh. And people only had a half hour so they would and now you call them food trucks, food trucks. and they're the biggest thing in the world okay that's really cool so that it that's, was kind of the start of the food truck trend yeah yeah, and yeah i had a food truck place where yeah. we parked food trucks oh really so, yeah i was I, I was in that too i've owned okay. six seven restaurants i'm opening up a restaurant now okay so yeah tell us about that what's I'm coming working up next on, for you oh, i just finished a funnier die video okay and the Funny or Die video was written by Adam McKay and it's, I don't know, if, it hasn't come out yet, but I have to tell you that my character was the official spray tanner of the President of the United States of America. Oh my gosh, that's Donald Trump. awesome. <laughs> and I needed to go somewhere to learn to... to how to do the end, so I didn't know she owns a spray tank yeah. company. Right. So I, I've done that. I just finished a movie with Hal Linden, which is called The Samuel Project. Okay. And he plays a Holocaust victim, and he describes the DP camp. And the DP oh, camp yeah. is a displaced people. Right. I had never heard that outside of Armenians. And his grandson and my son do a project for school about the Holocaust and the genocide, and that's why it's called the Samuel Project. Okay, and then how can we keep up with you and kind of learn what's coming next for you? You have some social Ask media. Josh. Ask Josh. I don't know. <laughs> you don't have, you have, have a Facebook I have, page? I have a Facebook, okay. and I have a, a fan page. Okay. Facebook is full. It's 5,000 people, they're telling me. Yes, and so you're too I, popular. I have not gotten one of these companies that run the Facebook for you or run the fan page. I have to do that. I'm, okay. I'm mostly I'm working on uh, raising a granddaughter and trying to get a pilot on the road. Plus, okay. we are, we went two years ago to establish film law in the country of Armenia. Hmm. And we have recently gotten film law legislation written my partner has been hired to go live in Armenia two months ago to be the commissioner of film. And the plan is to build a studio in Armenia, somewhat like Universal City, where there's hotels, there's a tourist attraction, but we want to build a studio because there is nothing over there that is similar to what we have so you have to do some of your work over there and you have to come over here so we want to we want Armenia I want Armenia to be a, a film hub a, a film capital because I only know film and rubbish so <laughs> well thank you again for sharing a lot about your life with us is there anything you want to leave us with just a little tidbit of I'm a grandfather <laughs> there we go well thank you so much Ken thank you and get your copy of the magazine and watch the, the web thing. And remember, Josh and Solicito, they yes. make this magazine. Yes. And it's got everything. And one of the reasons that people are so open is because 
this is not like an interview. I, I, and these people are my friends. So it's a lot of that friendship and networking. And so I, I just hope them all the great success and health. Good night.